Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning Live webinar series. Today, focused on top gear for travel. When you're traveling for photography, which if you're anything like me, much of your photography involves travel. And of course, we want the latest and greatest gear. Well, more importantly, tools that are going to help us in our photography to sort of streamline your workflow, maybe lighten up your load just a little bit. So we're going to talk about a variety of equipment, a variety of tools. Keep in mind, I did present not too long ago another webinar on some of the other top gear for general photography. And so I won't duplicate the coverage of those particular topics, but today really focused on gear that I find especially helpful when it comes to travel, traveling for photography. So not necessarily just travel photography, but photography when traveling, which it's a little bit of a fuzzy line even for myself because I travel so much for my photography, at least under normal circumstances, that almost you could say that all of my photography is travel photography, since it's photography while traveling. But the point is that when we are on the go with our cameras, we want to try to keep things light and mobile and efficient, etc. So we'll start off here and talk about some of the uh, general topics. First off, for those of you who do not know me yet or haven't seen very much of me in this online world and in the world of photography, I'm Tim Gray. And many of you have been following my Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, which I know many of you have heard this before. It, it never changes for me. It never ceases to surprise me to say that I've been publishing the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter now for over 20 years. Just an absolute shock. But And funny enough, as many of you know, I actually thought that there might be a time when I had answered all the questions that needed to be answered. A silly thought indeed. So I am Tim Gray. I publish the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. I also produce a variety of video training courses that you can find at graylearning.com and all sorts of other things that I'm involved in, photo workshops, speaking at events, etc. You can learn a lot about that at timgrayphoto.com. For today's presentation, I do want to thank Hunt's Photo and Video for sponsoring the presentation. And most importantly, I, first off, I do appreciate, obviously, Hunt's sponsoring today's presentation to make it possible. I also want to thank Noah Buchanan of Hunt's for, perhaps most importantly, at least for all of you, putting together some show specials, as it were. So I'll share a link at the end of today's presentation with details on how you can get many of the items I'm going to be talking about today at a discounted price if those items are of interest to you. And then a quick couple of notes, little promotional items here. I do have an upcoming online workshop that I'm going to be teaching that will focus on mastering photo optimization in Photoshop. And so this is a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, more or less all day for both days, with live online sessions, the opportunity to get your questions answered, the opportunity to follow up via email with additional questions. All of the sessions are recorded. So you can learn more about that at timgray.me slash wow Photoshop, as in weekend online workshop Photoshop. And in addition, I want to mention, if you missed the special, we did this for April Fools just for a little bit of fun, I recorded a course in Europe way back in 2014, seems like forever ago, but it was focused, while it was travel photography, it was really focused on night photography, and even though it's a little bit of an old course, and I look a lot younger in those videos, the content there, the topics are still, I think, very valuable to photographers even today. Not much has changed in night photography other than the gear itself, and so you can check that out at timgray.me slash night, and if you use that link, a coupon code will be applied automatically so that you'll get the course for free. So I hope you enjoy that and find that helpful. But without further ado, let's dive in and talk about top photo gear for travel. And so, you know, I should start off first and foremost by talking about, you know, photography for me often involves travel. Travel is certainly a passion of mine in addition to photography. And I've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel to a variety of locations. This map, for example, this is out of Lightroom Classic. The map module shows all of my photos on the map with these push pins. The numbers, by the way, a common question, those indicate how many photos in that specific location. If you zoom in, you'll start to see a more detailed picture. Well, not you, but in Lightroom Classic, if you zoom in to that map, you'll see a more detailed view of those push pins. So you get a better sense of exactly where the photos were captured. 
provided you have a camera with a built-in GPS receiver, of course. But since so much of my photography typically involves travel, a priority for me in terms of choosing a camera is having a camera with a built-in GPS receiver. And so that's a feature that I find very, very helpful. Obviously, over the past couple of years, many of you, my, and certainly myself, we've not been able to actually travel very much with the limitations brought on by the pandemic. And so I've seen, for example, in many of the comments today that some of you are looking forward to kicking off your travels coming up again soon. In fact, we're kicking off the Palouse Photo Workshops in June. We've not been able to do those for a couple of years now because of the pandemic. So finally, we seem to be getting ahead of the curve here. Things are starting to open up more and more. Travel is opening up. And so I thought it was timely to talk about travel in the context of photography. I know many of you are itching to get out there and travel with your cameras some more. And so I hope today's presentation is particularly helpful on that front. And so whenever I'm traveling, and over the years, you know, as my travels have changed, as my travels got to be more frequent over the years, I started to really prioritize traveling light and, and trying to find just the right tools for the right job, so to speak. Uh, especially as I'm getting older, I certainly appreciate a lighter camera bag more than I used to. And so when I'm setting out, one of the first things, not exactly gear, I promise we'll talk about quite a bit of gear here, but one of the items I want to mention to you is backing up. Before I venture out on a trip, before I head out to capture photos, whenever I'm getting ready to go somewhere, I'm leaving something behind, and that's usually my hard drives containing my photos. So before I travel, and especially if I'm traveling with hard drives, which more often than not is the case, I'll talk about those drives a little bit later, when I'm traveling, I'm leaving some hard drives behind, I'm leaving some of my data behind, maybe some of my photos behind, I want to make sure that before I leave, I've got a good backup. Really, I want a good backup always. <laughs> Whenever I've added new photos or updated important data, I want to update my backups, but I find that's especially top of mind when I'm getting ready to head out on a trip, especially if it's an extended trip. And so as I'm sure many of you are familiar, the tools that I use for backing up my photos and my other important data on the left side here is GoodSync. I use that for a local backup. I back up, for example, my photos external hard drive to a photos backup external hard drive. And then I do it again to a photos backup number two external hard drive. So I use GoodSync as my local backup solution. You can learn more at timgray.me slash gray backup. And there is, this was in an Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. I believe it's already been published. If not, it'll be published in the next day or two. But there was a question about using GoodSync's cloud-based storage. That is an option for backing up to the cloud. I only use GoodSync for local backup. So backing up a hard drive in my possession to another hard drive in my possession. And so for the online backup solution, because I've been using it for a number of years and I found it to be reliable and more cost efficient, for the cloud-based backup, I use Backblaze. And you can learn more about that at timgray.me slash online backup. And that provides me with an off-site backup. Where? I don't know. I don't know where Backblaze has their servers, but wherever that is, that's where my important data is being backed up into the cloud. So I have that off-site. So if for some reason I were to lose all of my hard drives at home, I would still have that online backup that I could fall back on. And then, of course, once I've got my photos, my data all backed up before I head out, then I want to consider how I'm going to get to my destination. More importantly, perhaps, how my gear is going to get to my destination. And I actually divide this up into a couple of different pieces. One is getting there, and the other is while I'm there. And so when I'm traveling to a location, often by airline, for example, I want to try to carry my gear as safely as possible and as efficiently as possible. And so this is a Think Tank roller bag. This is actually the Airport Advantage roller bag. One of the nice things about this particular bag is that it fits in most overhead bins, even for the smaller commuter airliners. And so not necessarily every airplane that's out there, not every airplane even has overhead bin space, but this is a good option for needing to connect on some of the smaller flights. There's a variety of sizes, obviously. A lot of this depends on the specific gear that you have that you're going to be bringing with you. But I treat a bag like this as my sort of dense 
condensed, hopefully, storage, as it were, for traveling, for getting to my location. I don't necessarily need to have this bag out with me all the time when I'm out in the field capturing photos, for example, but it's a great way to get my gear there in the first place safely, ideally carry on. And I usually keep my camera bodies and lenses in my carry-on bag, hard drives in a carry-on bag. Basically, the things that I think are most fragile and most important to me, I'll put into a bag that I'll carry on to the aircraft. And the items that I'm not quite as concerned about, still maybe concerned about, but not as concerned about, I'll put into checked luggage if I'm going to check a bag. So something like a tripod, I'll often put carefully, wrapped up in padding, clothing, or what have you, but I'll put that into a checked bag just to allow for more space in the carry-on bag, which I try to keep rather small. So there's a wide variety of bags from Think Tank. I'm, I'm a big fan of their bags. There are specials from Hunts on those that I'll share later, but something along these lines where, again, finding the right size based on the amount of gear you need to bring with you, depending on the type of photography. Bird photographers, I'm sorry, you're going to need to carry a lot more gear, a lot bigger and heavier gear than a travel photographer, for example. But finding the right bag for your needs that'll get you there. And then I also like to have a, a smaller bag as my getting around bag, as my out in the field capturing photos type of a bag. And so this is the bag I'm using currently. It's the Low Pro Pro Tactic BP350. It's very small, it's, it's skinny, it's lightweight. This is fine. I use this for digital SLR. It's great for mirrorless as well. Lots of nice convenient uh, accessory pouches essentially for us to get to all the gear that we need. And mostly it's small and lightweight. And so as I mentioned, when I'm getting to a location, I'm usually going to have more gear than I need for an individual outing while I'm traveling for my photography. And so if at all possible, I prefer a backpack in general and a smaller backpack if possible. So again, there's many different sizes and shapes when it comes to backpacks for carrying your gear or other styles of bags for your camera gear. But I find that I do prefer to have a little bit larger bag for getting to my destination and then a secondary bag. And fortunately, this usually can count for my two carry-ons. So one that's going in the overhead bin and then this backpack that's really small that can fit. You know, it's basically my laptop case and then I can put that in the underneath the seat in front of me, typically, more often than not, at least when I'm not on the very smallest of flights of, air, of aircraft. And a uh, question here, how much total data are you backing up with Backblaze? And so with my local backup, I actually have, now it's, oh, around about 12 terabytes, I think it is, of total data that I'm backing up on my local hard drives. I've not caught up with all of that on Backblaze. I'm up to just shy of a terabyte. I'm actually going through a cleanup process on my hard drives as I'm catching up with that online backup so that I get all of my externals built into my backup with Backblaze. And so that can take time, literally months, to get everything backed up to an online cloud-based backup service. And yeah, so it, there was a question also about using a camera with a built-in GPS receiver. There's a variety of options that are available. I happen to be using a digital SLR still. Yes, I know. I'm one of those photographers who hasn't gone mirrorless. I'm maybe one of the very few these days who's not yet gone mirrorless, but there are a variety of cameras that do have a built-in GPS receiver. I happen to be using as my primary camera the Canon 7D Mark II, but there are several other models from Canon. There's some models from Nikon various cameras, uh, especially as we get into the mirrorless models where the GPS receiver is built in. But also keep in mind, if, you've, if you haven't yet upgraded to a camera with a built-in GPS receiver or you're, you're not ready to take that step, essentially, you don't want to prioritize just the GPS receiver, you can use other tricks. So for example, using a smartphone to record a track log that you then synchronize with your photos or just capturing reference photos with your smartphone. All right, and then of course, when we're traveling, a very common question that I get from so many photographers traveling with a tripod, uh, I've confessed more than once over the years that I don't tend to use a tripod unless it's absolutely necessary. But obviously there are many situations where it is absolutely necessary. And so then trying to travel as light as possible. There's trips where I feel that I need a bigger, heavier, sturdier tripod 
And so I'll take the ball head off, put it into checked luggage, wrap it up carefully. But if you can get a travel tripod that'll meet your needs, so much the better. This is actually a really nice model that I, I still don't know how to properly pronounce the name, but a Sirui, I think, maybe? Don't quote me on that. But their travel tripod here. And this is carbon fiber. It can hold up to about 25 pounds, and it weighs less than 3 pounds. And it lists for around about $300. Again, do keep in mind that Hunts will have some specials related to the gear that I'm talking about today that I'll share at the end of today's presentation. But a nice, compact relatively small tripod that can support a good amount of gear. 25 pounds is a pretty good amount of support and a nice stable package, carbon fiber, so it's lightweight and very strong. I often get the question, by the way, about aluminum versus carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is going to be stronger at the same weight, but keep in mind that aluminum tripods can also be very small and relatively stable. But generally speaking, if you don't mind spending a little bit more, you're going to get greater support in terms of the, the weight and the stiffness of the tripod, a little bit sturdier with a carbon fiber tripod. And so something that I generally do recommend, it's gonna be more expensive, no question, to opt for a carbon fiber tripod versus aluminum, but there are some advantages that I think can be very, very helpful if you don't mind spending a little bit more money on that tripod. All right. Yeah, so weight limitations for carry-on. Uh, this is a newer issue, I would say. Good question, Frank, in terms of being able to carry on. Now, over the years, I've found that enforcement tends to be fairly minimal, but my approach whenever I'm carrying on camera gear is to assume that I may need to check my camera gear. So I always treat it as a carry-on. Bearing in mind that these roller bags, such as the Think Tank that I mentioned earlier, they are reasonably secure in terms of keeping your gear snug and safe. And especially with the padded dividers that you can customize the position with the hook and loop and being able to, you know, I'll stuff additional clothes or rags or whatnot, thing, whatever I'm gonna be bringing with me that might have some degree of padding so that there's no empty space for things to bounce around. But my approach is to always operate under the assumption that I may need to check that bag. There's certain things that I never want to put in a check bag, like a laptop, ideally hard drives, ideally my camera and lenses, but with a, a good bag, a roller bag that is really designed to keep that gear safe, then I feel reasonably comfortable. I'm never completely comfortable gate checking, but I feel reasonably comfortable gate checking gear under those circumstances. And so I'll pack accordingly. The more delicate items that I want to absolutely make sure that I'm carrying onto the aircraft, I'll put those into my smaller backpack that I know will fit under the seat in front of me. And then the other gear that I'm hoping I'll be able to carry on to the plane but obviously, you know, this is where also I'm a big fan of trying to make sure that you're going to be able to board early. And so whether that means flying first class or if you're going to upgrade to a premium economy experience, whatever options are available in terms of being able to board early if, you've had, if you have status with the airline, etc. All of those can be very helpful. And, uh, so, and to Linda's question about the Think Tank, tank bag, that was the airport advantage, by the way. But I'll have links to those items, to, to the categories at least, at the end of today's presentation. But that one was the airport advantage, which is one that I treat as a roller bag when you need to connect on a commuter airline. All right, another cool tripod option. There's been a variety of these over the years, but this one I found to be a really nice one. The ProMaster Crazy Legs, love the name of that one, mobile tripod. Now, keep in mind, this is a smaller tripod. It only supports around about three pounds of weight. So it's not going to be for most of your digital SLRs and lenses, more for your smaller mirrorless or even smaller cameras. So up to three pounds, smartphone, for example, which is another valuable accessory, as it were, for photographers who are traveling. And so this one in particular, this tripod, the Crazy Legs mobile tripod, I found that it's a lot more flexible in terms of just attaching anywhere. The structure of the legs, because it's not segmented, it just flexes around random objects much more easily. And I've done this in a variety of situations where either I'm not carrying my larger tripod or the larger tripod is just a little bit more cumbersome for what I'm trying to accomplish. And so I've used these types of tripods with the flexible legs to attach a camera to tree branches and fences and railings and all sorts of uh, interesting objects that I've had to attach a camera to 
for things like recording time lapse or longer exposures or you know what remote triggering and those sorts of things and so the general concept here of a tripod lighter weight tripod with flexible legs is i think a great concept this can by the way stand up if you straighten out the legs but this is a particular model that i think is great but at some point you're going to want to have a tripod like this i think whether it's for your smartphone or for one of your lighter weight cameras uh, and again even many mirrorless cameras would be accommodated with this type of device and you know especially I, I was talking to noah of hunt's photo and video about putting together some specials for today's presentation based on the gear that i plan to talk about and he gave me a few suggestions and one of them was a power adapter and I sort of laughed a little bit because this is something I've been dealing with for decades with international travel where you need an adapter to adapt, for example, in my case, the U.S. plug to a European outlet, for example. And so he sent me this link and I've seen these before, but it, it just made me laugh because I do recall having to plan in advance for which adapters I needed and having to carry multiple adapters if I was going to be visiting multiple countries most of europe or much of europe anyway has the same plug for example but then the uk has a different plug and some eastern european countries and other neighboring countries have different plugs and going to asia it's yet different plugs and so i would have to kind of do my research in advance and find out which adapters i needed for the different locations i would be visiting and you know, I know in many cases your travels might take you to a single destination maybe a single country but it doesn't take adding too many countries to add adapters that you need to carry. I've been fortunate enough to teach on board a cruise ship, for example, that would travel to multiple countries. I've done train trips where I've visited different countries with different adapter needs. And so this little ProMaster power adapter is just fantastic. I discovered this relatively recently. I'm sure it's been around for a long time, but I was relatively new to the game. But this enables you to universally adapt just about any outlet. So I can take a European plug and make it fit a U.S. outlet. Now, obviously, you do need to check the device itself to make sure that it supports the voltage, the power that it's getting. And so, for example, in the U.S., we have, what is it, 110 volt? And in Europe, it's, I think, 220 volts or roughly double anyway, somewhere in that neighborhood. But the point is that if you have a device, you take a hair dryer from the U.S. and plug it in in Europe, it's going to not dry your hair and it's going to smoke. In many cases, you'll ruin it because in many cases, those types of devices will not support the different voltages. And so make sure most of your camera gear is going to support the voltage range. So looking at your battery charger and making sure that it indicates something along the lines of 100 volt to 250 volts or somewhere in that general range so that it includes the range for all of the power at the countries you're going to visit so that you don't fry any of your gear. And as long as your electronic devices, your chargers, for example, or your power adapters, your, the power supply for your laptop, for example, as long as all of those support the power in the location that you're visiting, the locations you're visiting, then all you really need to do is have an adapter that will adapt the actual plug to fit the wall outlet. And this little adapter, I carry now several of these with me whenever I'm traveling internationally so I can plug in multiple devices, but then I can plug essentially in any direction. Once I know that the devices themselves are safe for the power supply, then I can swap out in all sorts of different countries they do have a list of countries, by the way, if you take a look at the description there, and it covers, I would say, most of the countries that most of us are likely to visit in terms of those power supplies. And then when I'm traveling, well, in general, I'm one who likes to stay very organized and clutter-free, and when I'm traveling, that's especially important. I'm out of my element, not in my usual environment, and I'm on the go a lot, going out on different photo outings, etc., and so... I want to keep my accessories organized. You know, the camera and the lenses, that's relatively easy, all things considered. They're moderately large. I've got a backpack with, you know, compartments that's going to fit those different items. It's the little stuff that I find is really easy to lose track of. So one of the items that I like to carry is a wallet. So this is the Think Tank Photo Peewee 
Pixel Pocket Rocket Memory Card Wallet. It's a long name for a little package, but this is a little wallet that holds multiple cards, and they have a variety of different models, some that are focused on Compact Flash, others that are focused on SD cards, some that have a, a mix, different quantities in terms of how many cards you can vary. But we've got little slots for the individual cards. It rolls up and has a hook and loop to hold it shut. Notice a little loop hanging off there where we can attach. And actually, it comes with a little attachment so you can strap it onto a loop on a backpack or something like that. And so first and foremost, this is a great way to carry multiple cards and not have to worry about losing them. Not worry as much about losing them. But this also gives me a, a nice little workflow advantage, a little trick that I use to keep track. Hopefully, I've got a memory card that will get me through an entire photo shoot, for example, but every now and then I need to switch cards, and I might need to switch in a hurry. And so one of the tricks that I use here is if the label is pointed out, and so in fact, the card on the left here, you can see it happens to be a Lexar Professional card, and so you can see that it's label out. That's the, the, the front of the card, as it were. That tells me that that card is empty. It's ready for me to put into the camera and use for additional photos. When I have a card that I've already captured photos on, that it's full or partially full anyway, when I put it back in my card wallet, notice the card on the right, I put it backside out. I put it with the rear label facing outward, and that gives me a quick visual reference to let me know that which cards are ready to be used, are empty, I've reformatted recently, for example, and which cards already have images on them that might be full, for example. So that's a nice little handy trick. So number one is not losing my cards, keeping them organized, which by the way, I keep this card wallet inside my traveling backpack, the backpack that I'm using when I'm out in the field. And with that little loop and the, the strap that comes with, I do attach it to my backpack, but not on the outside. I put it on a loop on the inside so that I've got that sort of double security so I don't lose those cards especially the ones that already have photos on them. So a really handy device there. Uh, quick question following back. Uh, Chris is asking if I carry a transformer as well for the voltage differences. No, I don't carry a transformer. This is something I used to need to carry way back in the early days of my travels when it was less likely that my devices were going to support the full range of voltages when I was traveling. But now, so far, all of my devices support the voltages that I need. As I mentioned, things like hair dryers or hair irons, uh, some of these devices that have a higher power output, but those are things, as you can probably appreciate by my lack of a good hairdo, that I don't make use of. There are hair dryers, for example, that are designed for those different voltages, but many are not. But in terms of my photography and my technology, all of my devices right now do support my laptop's power supply, my battery chargers, etc. The, the power adapters for any external hard drives that need power. All of those various devices support the full range of power and therefore I don't need a transformer because the transformer is built in. And so I don't, I've not needed to carry an actual transformer on an international trip. Gosh, I, I'm sure it's been at least 10 years at this point thanks to just checking in advance, making sure that the gear actually supports. And yes, to Steve's question, the adapter versus the transformer. It is a very important distinction. I mentioned the hair dryer that you will fry if you just simply plug it in with an adapter. The adapter that I was talking about is purely adapting the plug. And so if I take a US hair dryer with an adapter for a European outlet and I plug it in, as soon as I turn on the hair dryer, it will be destroyed most likely, in most cases, or at least in my experience, in most cases, and the hair dryers that are sold in the US do not support the voltage in Europe. And so if you have a device that does not support the voltage, either leave it at home and get a replacement that does support the voltage, or you will need a transformer. So do keep in mind that the adapter for the plug is not transforming. In other words, it's not converting that European higher voltage to the lower voltage supported by some US. Well, the, the standard US outlets are 110 volt and many of the devices only support that. So yes, good point, Stephen. An important item to underscore because I don't want anybody coming to me when they blow up their hair iron when they're traveling. <laughs> All right, so the cards themselves, very helpful. I also have used a battery holder in the past little pouches that I've used. And my primary motivation, well, okay, it was twofold. Number one, batteries are reasonably small and I don't want to lose them. 
But number two is that I don't want to risk having a loose battery bouncing around in my camera bag, for example, and then a metal object, maybe some keys, for example, close the circuit between the two prongs, as it were, of the battery and fry that battery, possibly start a fire. And so there's good reason to keep your batteries. This is why most camera batteries come with a little plastic cover that goes onto the battery itself to block those contacts. But using a pouch, a battery pouch, sort of like a card wallet, but designed for batteries, can be helpful in that regard. But I've just learned of another cool product that adds an additional piece of utility, and that is this one here, the battery indicator pouch. And so obviously a pouch that holds batteries, and it has little cards inside. This is not automatic. It's not checking the actual charge of your batteries. That would be a really cool feature. If anybody comes up with that, it was my idea first. So, <laughs> But we've got these little cards, green and red, that indicate fresh batteries versus depleted batteries. So that sort of like my trick of putting the cards in backwards when they're already full, when you put an empty battery, well, empty meaning discharged battery, back in the pouch, you flip the little card so that red shows through the little window, and so you know at a glance which batteries are fresh, fully charged versus depleted. I actually have used, in some cases, that same trick of putting the batteries in backwards, but that's not always very easy. Sometimes they don't fit in properly backwards because of the shape, and it's not quite as obvious, I find, in my experience. So this is a really handy tool that I have found in terms of, number one, a battery pouch, which I was already using, but now one that has this ad additional feature of being able to, sh to give you an indication that you have fresh batteries versus discharged batteries. Uh, Alan's question here, how do you attach a power strip to your adapter? Uh, so <laughs> if you need five chargers at once, yeah, so very often you can travel with a power adapter. Do make sure that the power adapter also supports that voltage because these often will have a fuse so they'll blow if, for safety reasons obviously, beyond. And so you'll need to get a power adapter that again supports the voltages and then use the adapter for the power strip. And I actually, I, it's not something I included in today's presentation, but what I've done is travel with a couple smaller, instead of you know the larger strips that are six or eight power outlets that oftentimes you can't get all of your plugs to fit, there's some smaller ones that are, for example, three outlets that have more space in between. And so one of these types of adapters I found works very nicely as well. All right. And then, speaking of pouches, I am a big fan of using filters, and this is, it's always an interesting sort of funny topic to me where photographers who, like myself, got started in the film days, we were accustomed to using so many different filters on our lenses, and then we transitioned to digital a long, long time ago, obviously, and you were still sort of in that habit. And then I started realizing I don't need most of these filters. So I don't carry very many filters. Usually I carry a couple of neutral density, solid neutral density filters, and often carry a polarizing filter, for example. And so one of my favorites, by the way, is a 10-stop neutral density filter so that I can get, I think this shot was something like 30 seconds during daylight. I was able to get 30-second exposures with a 10-stop filter, which is wonderful. Can give you all sorts of creative possibilities. Of course, you make a photo like this and everyone's going to assume that you created this effect in Photoshop. They'll probably never believe you that you actually created this photo. Well, they would never believe, first of all, seeing blue sky in Seattle, I suppose. <laughs> but then also having you know, these clouds that were moving quite quickly across the sky and using a solid neutral density filter made it very easy to create such an effect. But those filters, you know, they obviously they're relatively small, all things considered, but perhaps more importantly, is that they're a little bit delicate. They're obviously subject to breakage or scratching, etc. And so another pouch that I carry, this is the Filter Nest Mini from Mindshift Gear. And they have a variety of models. The one I use carries four filters, which is more than enough for me in most cases, with two to three solid neutral density filters and a polarizing filter. They have, there's some that carry just three filters and I think the others are maybe six filters. The point is that they have different sizes for different quantities of filters. I didn't use the interior shot here, but on the inside, it also has a color coding, meaning you've got a little, uh, you know, there's a, a red marker and then a green and a blue or whatever the colors happen to be. I've forgotten now. 
And so those colors to me sort of indicate strength or indicate the feature. So I would use blue for my polarizing filter because I associate that sort of with the sky. I think it was red, yellow, I forget the other colors, but whatever the sort of the priority was, red would be sort of the strongest priority. That would be my strong neutral density filter. And then I would go down in the other colors accordingly. Uh, but the point is that they've got this color coding system inside so that you can sort of associate particular filters with a particular color to help you not have to always pull out the filter to see which filter is in which of the little pouches here. And this uh, seals shut with the hook and loop. You can see it's got a loop up on top so that you could strap it onto something inside your, your backpack or what have you. And so that I find works very, very nicely for keeping those filters both safe and organized as well. I also find that uh, when traveling, uh, there's a lot that you have to sort of allow for, that you have to be flexible about when you're traveling. And one of those is the weather. And so especially I would find when I was leading photo workshops, having to be as the leader, flexible, but also tremendously stressed out about what the weather forecast showed, especially if there was going to be rain. and. Obviously, you know, when we're traveling for photography, we're often on some degree of a schedule. We've got limitations. We're only in a particular location for a certain amount of time, for example. So sometimes you have to make do with the weather that you're given. And in fact, trying to, you know, sort of make lemonade out of lemons, if the weather's not great, what sort of great opportunities can we create for ourselves, better photographs based on the weather? Maybe not as good as if the weather had cooperated better, but photos that'll be interesting by virtue of the weather. So this happens to be in Salzburg, for example. We had, you can see some sunshine there, just some passing showers, thankfully, at this viewpoint overlooking Salzburg. And there's a little bit of a short glass wall. And so I actually ducked down in order to shoot through the glass to get some water droplets in the foreground or leading a field photography workshop in New York City. And it was raining. And so that, all right, we're going to get some cars, some Ubers, we're not going to drive them ourselves, and we're going to sit as passengers and shoot out the window, focusing on the raindrops, where I've got essentially a fixed foreground, you might say. This is sort of that compose and wait concept, where I'm capturing raindrops on the window and waiting for some interesting colors, a yellow cab in New York City here, for example, to show up. And if you do venture out, not into dangerous weather, but if you venture out into weather conditions, very often you'll find that you can get photos that would have otherwise been impossible. So during one of these photo workshops in New York City, there were thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms forecast. But I looked at the forecast and the details looked reasonably okay for us to get out and do some photography, take a break for dinner with a reservation, knowing when the rain was approximately going to show up and missing the rain pretty much all together, and then being able to get out there and photograph. This happened to be over in Brooklyn, photographing the Manhattan skyline from Brooklyn, with, in this case, the Brooklyn Bridge in the foreground. And I managed to, through luck, get a lightning strike as part of one of the photos that I captured. And the real lesson there is that even when the weather is not great, you can still get great photos, but that sometimes means being out in the elements. And so I've often been one to kind of be a little bit careless. Many cameras, for example, are weather sealed, but I haven't lost a camera to the weather, but I've had more than <laughs> enough issues where I've lost gear to the elements. And so finding a way to better protect your gear when you actually need to be out there or want to be out there in the elements. So this Vortex Media Storm Jacket, you can see it sort of envelops everything with these drawstring enclosures so that you can get it around the lens, ideally a lens hood, so you've got a little bit more protection around the front element of the lens and then along the backside. So you've got just enough to get to your camera and make adjustments to the settings and capture photos, of course, along the way, but keeping the overall system relatively dry. I should have actually added a little aside accessory for travel, and that would be lens cloths, which I'll sort of talk about here momentarily. But another tip, which I'll get to in just a moment, but when it comes to rain, for example, if and many photographers sort of forget about the fact that it's raining because they don't need to worry. They've got a storm jacket over their camera, but then they neglect to realize that there's water droplets being blown in. Even with a lens shade that can help keep the water out, 
if it's windy, you can have water droplets hitting that front lens element, which can lead to some problems in the photos, obviously. And so being sure under rainy conditions, for example, that you check that front lens element to see if there are any particular uh, water droplets or other debris getting on there that you'll want to clean off. So a lens cloth or an item that I'll talk about here momentarily. Uh, and I see Naomi's question here, like a recommendation for a women's backpack for hiking. Uh, good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't have personal experience there, but I know that uh, Noah at Hunt's Photo can certainly follow up with that and give you recommendation. And so, Naomi, I'll share a link at the end of today's presentation. And any of you who've got any questions about gear, if you've got particular concerns, uh, special needs related to your photo gear, a particular gear that you need, email uh, the page that I'll link to will have Noah's email address at Hunt's Photo, and he would welcome your questions about any gear uh, input that he can provide in terms of gear. And I know he'd be a good one to answer that question for you. All right, so speaking of that front lens element, keeping your lenses clean, and I find many photographers have a tendency to neglect this. I'm not suggesting that I'm one of those photographers because I'm not going to admit how much image cleanup I had to do for this photo because I realized that there may have been some dust spots or I guess some, some uh, pollen, as it were, from the, the wheat field in front of me, some dust getting onto that front lens element, which when you're including the sun or a, another strong light source in the frame, those little spots will just light up and be a real big distraction, real big blemishes that you'll have to clean up. Again, I'm not admitting that that was the case here, but it might have been. But fortunately, there's some great tools, and this is a handy little kit that Noah had shared with me. Actually, I hadn't seen this before, but a handful of items, accessories for cleaning the lens. So you've got a little blower and a camel hair brush and swabs, the tissues and the, the cleaner all fitting into a nice little pouch so that you can get those smudges. Uh, if you've ever, again, I'm not admitting this has happened to me, but if you've ever put smudges on the front lens element when you were trying to add or remove a filter or you've got dust that's been, you know, been blowing and accumulating or those water droplets, maybe they dried on and left some residue. So having a kit, just a small compact little kit that you can carry. And they actually, you'll notice the little wipes that they have. They also sell these wipes separately, which are great wipes for cleaning lenses and eyeglasses. Same, the same ones that are included in this kit, you can get those standalone as well. I guess you can think of those as refills, essentially. And I found those to be tremendously helpful. Make sure to get any debris, things you know, like sand and grit, off the front lens element carefully with a blower or brush very delicately. And then just to get rid of smudges or anything else that's remaining there, you can use those wipes. And then, you know, it's interesting, I was going through some really old photos from a trip to Bosque del Apache and went there for some bird photography. And this was many, many years ago. Did I mention that? A very long time ago. And I suppose relatively early in my days as a digital photographer and looking at these photos, reviewing old photos, and actually I'm working on a little bit of a cleanup project to get rid of some of the old outtakes that I really don't need to keep in my library. I was shocked embarrassed. In fact, I, now I'm wishing I hadn't shared this photo with you because if you look at the top left corner, all of those spots, those are not birds off in the distance rendered out of focus. They are not gnats or flies buzzing around my lens. Those are dust spots on my image sensor. I, I wish I had a better excuse other than I was much younger and <laughs> not as careful as a photographer back then. Or I just got careless on this one trip. I don't even know. But I was horrified to see what a filthy mess that sensor was. And so fortunately, I've, I've learned my lesson long since, uh, a long time ago, to carry sensor cleaning swabs and solution. And so photographic solutions, uh, Photosol is one of the items that I've been using for quite a while. And so these sensor swabs, these do come in different sizes. So make sure that you get the right size for your camera. Make sure that it's okay to clean the sensor on your camera. You're really cleaning the filter on the front of the camera, at least in most cases, you've got that filter, an anti-aliasing filter, for example, or an infrared cutoff filter. So you're really cleaning the filter. So check to make sure that your camera can be cleaned. And if you're at all uncertain, send your camera in. Most camera manufacturers have a specific 
service, essentially a repair service where you can send your camera in for cleaning. A lot of events now that photo events are finally starting to happen again in person, very often these will have options for you to get your gear cleaned while you're at the event. So if you're not comfortable with it, because keep in mind, if you damage your sensor, that's going to be an expensive mistake, probably more expensive than the camera itself, so you'll end up just replacing your camera. But that having said that, I've been cleaning my own cameras for years and have never had any issues with it and have been grateful when I'm out in the field, discover some of those dust spots and can actually clean them off. And so swabs with a sensor cleaning solution provides a really great approach where you can actually clean that sensor and get all those dust spots and keep it nice and perfectly clean so that you won't have any of those embarrassing spots, blemishes, Every now and then, you know, not just dust spots, you find little bits of fuzz or threads or what have you that'll get stuck there because when you're capturing a photo, when the sensor is active, it creates a static charge and so it is like a vacuum. Any dust that's gotten in there will attach itself more than likely to the sensor itself. And then I mentioned at the top of today's presentation, backing up my photos and I thought it might be worthwhile to mention storage. So I have been using, as many of you know, for a long time, the LaCie Rugged hard drives. And there are two key reasons that I favor these drives. One, of course, they're rugged. And so when I'm traveling, I like to have that extra layer of protection. I'm told these can be dropped from something like five or six feet onto a hard surface and still be okay. I'm not interested in testing that out myself. You notice not only are they shockproof by themselves, but they also have this bumper to help with that. And so a little bit more rugged, being able to take a little bit more abuse out there in terms of being jostled around and dropped. But also another attribute that I look for with hard drives, especially because I tend to travel so much for my photography, is that the drive is bus powered. And what that means is I only need a data cable. For example, a USB cable. I don't need to have a power supply for the hard drive itself. Plug it into, for example, a USB port on my laptop, and it's powered up, I've got data, and I can save my photos. And so these are my preferred hard drives when it comes to photos on the go. And so I actually use LaCie Rugged as my primary storage, and then I'll use less expensive hard drives. These aren't the cheapest hard drives, but they're very good. I don't need rugged hard drives for at home for backup purposes, so I'll use less expensive hard drives for my local backups at home, but my LaCie Rugged drives are my primary storage so that if I'm going out on a trip and I want to bring my photos drive with me so I have access to all of my images on the go, I can use that. But even if you're just using a rugged drive while you're traveling, you can always then bring those photos into your normal storage system, whatever that might be for your desktop computer, for example, when you get back home. I think these are great drives for when you need to be traveling with photos and other important gear, even if it's just a temporary storage solution while you're traveling. Even if you've got larger storage and network attached storage device or plenty of internal storage on your computer at home, these make for a great storage, hard drive storage when you're out in the field. Which leads me to another very common question that I get from so many photographers, especially when I talk about the fact that my laptop is my essentially only computer. A long, long time ago, we're talking, my goodness, probably about 15 plus, maybe even closer to 20 years ago, I used to have a desktop computer at home and a laptop for when I was traveling. As I started traveling more and more, I realized this is not making a lot of sense from a workflow standpoint. And so I transitioned to using a laptop as essentially my only computer. I'm using a laptop with an external monitor, so I've got two displays and a separate keyboard and mouse and a really nice setup that I'm very comfortable and happy with but it revolves around a laptop. So when I'm traveling, I can just disconnect the accessories, take my laptop, and I'm on my way. But whenever I talk about that, I'll usually get one-upped by photographers who say, okay, that's great, but what if I don't wanna travel with a laptop? And this used to be a challenge. I happen to be an iPhone user. Obviously, the answer here will depend a lot on what type of smartphone you might be using or tablet, mobile device you're using, but this used to be not so easy with iPhone. For Android, it was easier because many things admittedly are easier with Android. Some things not as easy compared to the iPhone, but two different platforms for smartphones and tablets, for example. But now, especially with the update to the Files app that you might be familiar with or you might have randomly discovered on your iPhone from a relatively recent update, it's possible to download photos, including raw captures, directly to a smartphone or a tablet, 
And it's also possible with some third-party utilities to save, and even with some of the built-in features with the Files app, for example, to transfer photos to an external hard drive. And so you might be familiar with the adapter that was available for the iPhone, probably still is available, an SD card, a, a smart digital card, media card adapter. But now the device that I actually use is essentially a simple USB adapter. And so I can take my card from my digital SLR, for example, put it into a card reader that I attach to this adapter, hook it up to my smartphone, and download photos into my smartphone. Obviously, you probably want to make sure you have a smartphone with lots of storage available, depending on your photo habits. But then you can download to your smartphone. But again, you can also connect a hard drive to the same USB port so that you can transfer those photos then from your smartphone to your external hard drive. And so that gives a, a yet more mobile solution. And I've actually been a little bit frustrated with this over the years because a long time ago, I'm one who needs to travel with a laptop because I need to be able to do various things. Well, needs. Want to be able to do various things. Uh, email, okay, I could check email on my smartphone, but if I'm writing an article or whatnot, which I'm almost always working when I'm on the go, I want my laptop with a proper keyboard so that I can you know, more efficiently get my work done. But I have taken trips. A long time ago, close to well, about 15 years ago, I took a trip where I did not bring a computer. I was gone for about a week, traveled to Japan, and I brought two devices they were great devices, they're no longer made. It had an LCD screen, an internal hard drive built into it, and adapters for, well, at the time, compact flashcards. And so I carried two of these, and whenever I would capture photos at the end of the day, I would download those photos to these devices. There's a handful of similar devices. Narbox is one of them that's out there, but I've just found that they're not as good as what was available a long time ago. I think there's just not enough demand, but fortunately, Laptops are fairly small, so you can always bring a laptop and download to hard drives. But now with an adapter, you can even do that with your smartphone or tablet, which I find is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, so Frank's asking about SSD drives for travel. So those LACI rugged hard drives, they are available as SSD as well as traditional hard drives in different capacities. They go up to, there is an eight terabyte model it's a little bit wider form factor. The standard small mini form factor goes up to five terabytes, but they do have those available in both traditional hard drive, spinning hard drives as it were, as well as SSD. So that would still be the solution I would recommend. Uh, yeah, so Mary Ellen, I, I guess I sort of answered that. She's asking, uh, do I always travel with a laptop? Yes, but really it's not so much for the photography, it's for all the other stuff that I need or want to be able to do in terms of you know working while I'm traveling so uh, and I, I did take I think that's probably about the last time that trip to Japan that was about 15 years ago probably the last time I traveled without a laptop but I'm a computer nerd so um, I, I have a special excuse I guess on that front and then uh, so yeah Jones asking should be traveling with an iPad Pro what do you need to get photos onto it? And all you need is an adapter. So this adapter that I have displayed, this is the lightning USB adapter. So that at the top is a lightning plug that goes into an iPhone. And at the bottom, you can see that there's a, a USB port that you can plug a card reader or a hard drive into. There's also another lightning port so you can plug in a charging cable, for example. But the, for the, the iPad Pro, that uses a USB port and so you'll have a different adapter. So think of it as the same thing, just at the top, instead of a lightning adapter, you'll have a USB-C adapter. And that will do the trick. And then using the Files app, you importing into Photos, there's a variety of ways that you can go through the workflow there, but the key is having that hard drive available to you. All right. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for the great questions, really good follow-up questions and comments along the way. I certainly appreciate that. And I do want once again to thank Hunt's Photo for sponsoring today's webinar presentation as part of the Gray Learning Live series. And here is that link as promised. So if you point your web browser to timgray.me, not .com, but .me slash hunts with no apostrophe, that will take you to a page on the Gray Learning website where you can see all the different specials as well as, as I mentioned, the 
a link, well, an email address for Noah Buchanan of Hunt's Photo and Video. If you've got any other questions, there's a couple of items that he asks that you email about. Most of the items on that page there are direct links for, but you can also email him with questions about certain of the items or something else you're looking for. Whatever you're in the market for, give Noah an email, send him an email, and he'll be happy to help. Great guy who knows a lot about all this gear. If you've got questions about mirrorless cameras, he's your man or other accessories, etc. And as I mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation, I also am teaching a weekend online workshop later this month focused on optimizing photos in Photoshop. So whether you're a Lightroom Classic user or not, this applies equally to help you get up to speed on making the most of Photoshop to optimize your photos. And again, just a quick reminder that if you're at all interested in night photography, you want to get some tips, you can get the course, my course, for free just by using this link to sign up on the Gray Learning website. And with that, again, thank you all very, very much. Thank you to Hunts for sponsoring today's presentation. Thanks for all of you for joining. Ah, actually, quick, one more little question here. So Howard, what about a thumb drive as a backup? Absolutely. And so if you've got, you know, in lieu of a hard drive, if you've got a thumb drive, little USB storage device that has enough capacity, you can even back up to additional memory cards. So if you bring more than enough SD cards, you could actually forget the hard drive and you could just download, for example, to a smartphone from an SD card and then copy those off over to another SD card so you've got that backup built in as well. So a variety of different workflows. I actually am going to put together a presentation focused on that type of mobile workflow because I've been getting a lot of questions about that. Uh, see Bruce's question here, is there a lens you prefer for travel? And I would say, that there is, some of you attended a webinar I did a while back about this trip where I took a single lens, one lens traveling around the world, and that was the 18 to 400 millimeter Tamron lens, which has become my go-to lens just because of the flexibility. Uh, remember the dust on the sensor. If I don't have to change lenses during a trip, I'm much less likely to get dust. So that's been a great go-to for many of my trips lately, and a lens that I find has been really, really helpful in terms of just greater flexibility. Obviously, that's for a digital SLR. There's similar, uh, and specifically crop sensor digital SLR, not full frame. But, uh, and, you know, there's many, many all-in-one zoom lenses. Obviously, it depends on your particular camera system as well. All right, it looks like that is all of the questions for today. So once again, thank you so much for joining me for this presentation as part of the Gray Learning Live webinar series. The recording will be available. It'll be right here on my Tim Gray TV channel on YouTube. And so thanks again, and I'll hope to see you uh, in another live presentation, plus as part of that weekend online workshop if you'd like to learn to make the most of Photoshop. So until then, thank you all very much.